people, but if you do, you should meet certain minimum standards of respect for their dignity and them as people, which entail better conditions and a certain level of pay. And I said, well, that's fine, and if you want to operate as a business on that model for yourself, if you feel this is the only way I should interact with people, that's fine, but if we mandate that, there's going to be plenty of people who could interact with people in poorer parts of the world and make their lives better and contribute to the process that lifts living standards there, who won't at all, because it's not going to be as profitable to do so. And as a result, we're going to leave a lot of people in worse situations. So it's one thing, that's, in fact, so someone having that ethical belief, I have no argument against saying that you should have a different one. What I would say is economics demands that we recognize what the trade-offs, the consequences of that are, and that's going to be real differences in the way people live in parts of the world who are thrown into worse alternatives for people to feel good about how we're interacting. And I also, by the way, when it comes to an ethical position, I've written with a, a business ethicist and a philosopher on this a little bit. It seems, it seems weird, Matt Zawinski is the philosopher I've done it with, it seems weird to me if we have a standard that says we're not ethically obligated to help people in the third world at all so that they don't have a positive right to something from us. If we do interact with them, we have to give them something more. Even if they're willing to accept something less and I could help more of them. To me, like, in terms of, it might be, you might say first best is I go in there and I interact with people on the standards that I think justice demands. It would seem, in terms of consequences, the worst is the person who doesn't go in and interact with them at all. And it seems weird to me if you accept that the person who doesn't go into and interact with them at all is okay, that the medium of going in there and giving them something better than what they have, but not as much as you wish justice would give them, is worse than that. To me, that's weird. But it's an ethical debate, I think, that we can have with lots of philosophers and stuff with a knockdown there. But my economics in me demands, though, is that we recognize the trade-offs and not pretend they don't exist. Go ahead and follow up. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I think, though, when you, when you frame this idea of alternatives, and that's kind of the, the underlying narrative, um, it's the world we live in. It's a world of scarcity with trade-offs. Sure. Um, oh, thanks. Um, but what, what, when, you, when you frame it this way, um, you're, you're kind of then saying, well, okay, we, we, give, them, we give them this sort of uh, best-worst alternative, and then off you go to economic development. Um, I feel like there's a handful of assumptions in the university. I mean, when you talk about the economic development, um, in the U.S. and how that coincided with the eradication of sweatshops. That's very different. Those are domestically owned companies. When you have foreign companies going and operating in other, in other countries, I mean, you're, you're neglecting the idea that maybe you're taking away operate, uh, like opportunities for these people uh, to empower themselves. If you, if you institutionalize the um, you know, exploitation of workers through uh, insisting there be a trade-off of wages and conditions, um, it's not obvious that that's going to lead to a path of economic development if you're institutionalizing disempowering people or preventing them from organizing, preventing them from coming together collectively and asserting, um, asserting better conditions, better wages. So, I mean, I, I, I understand you know, pre pretty clearly, you've made your, your arguments pretty clear. I, it's just it's not obvious that uh, economic development would be spurred on by similar things in a, in a peripheral nation um, than, than in a, in a core nation. So I'd argue that if we look at any wealthy country today, you'll see this as part of their history of economic development. It's with the exception of places that are just natural resource, rich off oil or something like that, but even then you don't see it because it's just a segment of society that's wealthy. Pick, 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 pick any country. You see, I'm not arguing that it's a sufficient condition for development, but I'm arguing that it is part of the process that's happened everywhere, not just the core versus the periphery. <coughs> Right. Um, well, couldn't you also say that even if you impose certain restrictions on companies, say like um, allowing workers to uh, organize, those companies might just turn to illegal, um, uh, what's it called, like Im immigrants, for example. Like we even have migrant workers in this country who work under terrible conditions because that's just the way that the market has um, has. Um, I can't speak today because I'm not running on a lot of sleep. But um, yeah, essentially that's how the market has, has come out to be. So it's like even if you if you held these uh, these overseas like corporations or whatever sweatshops to higher standards, like they would still find ways to get to uh, labor that. Uh, yeah, they corrupt the governments and ignore the laws. I mean, yeah, that yeah. Yeah, I, that, I mean, that happens a lot. On the margin, these laws impact it, but often the laws are simply ignored. And I will take the hard case and argue that in many of those cases, ignoring the laws is a best outcome available for the workers, because if you actually enforce the laws, they wouldn't have the jobs at all, and they'd be in the worst alternatives. Uh, and I think that's unfortunate, because then it promotes a culture of corruption that can lead to undermining other laws and better developments there, too. 
but it's a constrained optimum, I guess. Way in the back there. Uh, hey, I'm sorry, I, maybe I missed it. What was the source for figures two and three before? I can't remember what two and three were. These ones? Yeah, that oh. one the yeah these are uh, World Bank World Development Indicators. Okay. Uh, uh, and for this one, it's the derivation of the stuff from the uh, uh, news articles of the anti sweatshop groups there. So converting it all to purchasing power parity and averaging them together. Okay. So the source actually for that is the combination, and that's in the book that's coming out. Buy it. The reason why I asked that question was uh, you made a claim earlier about the increased wages for workers that are in these sweatshops. Uh, with corresponding increase in profits to the corporations that employ them. So my question is, is that uh, I have a hard time seeing how that's, uh, it seems to me that's an ought claim, so that it ought to be the case, but not so that it is the case that's occurring, that increase in profits for these corporations correspond with an increase in wages for these workers in these factories. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not arguing that. You're not arguing that? No. <laughs> so there's lots of things that can make profits go up that don't necessarily translate into higher extra productivity per worker, which was, would determine their wages. So as workers become more productive, that can bring more revenue to a firm. How much the firm of that cash is profits versus how much goes to the worker is going to be part of market forces. And there can be other forces that give you increased profits that don't come from the labor. So it doesn't necessarily come together. If I said something to imply that, I didn't mean to. Okay, because you, you, you just said that increased workers... Uh, so you said it was about the discussion about the as worker productivity increases, yeah. wages will go up. Yeah, that's what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily profits. That depends on external conditions. But mm -hmm. the amount of value a firm create an employee creates for the firm as that rises in a competitive market where there's other firms to try to bid them away, so you have an opportunity <coughs> cost. The wages will fall. I'm sorry, go ahead. So this is the last part of it was, are there, uh, it's, I'm fine. I was just going to say, are there specific examples and like case studies of this occurring like in a factory somewhere in the Thailand, for instance? Uh, I mean, yeah, you can just look at wage rates in these things over like 30 years and see as incomes are going up there. You can also, this isn't directly addressing it, but like on micro level data, the thing I did in Guatemala, this was only a snapshot of the survey for the working conditions part. One thing I did is ask them about their alternatives and how much they were paid in their prior job and how they felt about the conditions in this job, the prior one. And what you find is people are choosing as they became more productive to move into firms that are giving them better conditions and better pay. Uh, I mean, it's a small study of a micro thing, but you can do stuff like that. Last, last question. All right, you, you talk about you know, private property and you kind of gloss over the history of materialism at all as if like that's distant, distant in the past. And I, I you know, fundamentally object to that because the fact of the matter is, these effects are generational. These effects are ingrained in cultural behavior over hundreds of years, uh, of, from the history of slavery to the history of you know Jim Crow here to what's going on in Africa. And you act like, oh, now, oh, we're sorry, it's okay, and but this is the way it is now, so we just have to accept it. But we're accepting an ethos internationally. You're saying that it's okay for a very small few. It's always going to be that case, the case of the owners to constantly, you talk about economic growth and development, yes, when you're talking about poverty and all these different things, and those very low levels, but the thing is, that the land distribution in countries like Colombia and these places go back to who owned these places over generations and generations. So the, 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 the idea of it's a meritocracy based on you rise and fall on own, your own merit is flawed in the sense that we're not only not starting from the same start line, we're, we're dealing with land distribution based on the very imperialism that you're citing is no longer in effect. It has been, because a lot of these things are, are, are you're dealing with the generations of people in, you know, I dealt with them when I was coaching high school football in Jacksonville, one of the poorest schools in town, and you're dealing with kids of generations have been disenfranchised and like have been in communities where they've never been exposed to any of the stuff we're talking about and have, whether it's healthcare, for instance, you know, all these, even capitalist countries in Europe, you know, universal health care. And the thing is, is that I dealt with 85% of the kids that I coach in the inner city of Jackson Life's like no health insurance. They're in high school. So, so we expect them to work, to, to go to school, to play football, to, to do these things to try to, and that's, playing so, football has become something to, me, but I just think it's, pre, you're premising everything based on it's been a just distribution no, of resources by, by hard work. No, and, 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 well, it's, it so let me address, in agreeing with you on this, Okay. All property, virtually all property in the world somewhere is the product of a theft and an injustice at some point in the past, some more recent than others. We can recognize these things. We can oppose these things. That doesn't give us a blueprint of where you go from here. My constrained point in this lecture to all of you is the vast majority of things, the anti-sweatshop movement in particular, advocates for in response to the situations we see occurring in the world today will make that situation worse for those very people we care about. That doesn't mean there's nothing you can't do about it. 
that's a different conversation. I'm skeptical about how much you can. We can recognize an injustice and also recognize, given the way the world works, we can't remedy it. Maybe that's the case, maybe that's not. That's outside of the lecture from today. Fair today enough. is the point of the anti-sweatshop movement will make those people worse off. So if you are advocating that stuff, stop. And then maybe it switches into this conversation and you want sure. to work on these things. So I thank you all for coming today and for engaging the dialogue. By the way, Come find me if you want more information about our club. We have a bunch of free books and materials up here. There's going to be an after party later if you guys want to continue to discuss this stuff. John, raise your hand. Talk, talk to John. Thank you.